this building, this place, this space, this is the Stephen and Harriet Myers historic site. Uh, it's, it's on the net, network to freedom. It's a, uh, it's a site where Stephen and Myers and his wife Harriet and their four children lived in the mid-1850s, uh, 1855, 6, 7, right in there. When they lived here, they did what they probably had been doing, well, definitely been doing since, since about 1830, which was helping people with food, clothing, shelter, and transportation assistance and refuge in connection with uh, the Underground Railroad, people who were fleeing from enslavement and seeking help here in the city of Albany. I was teaching in a fifth grade classroom and I had these rather incredible, tangible 10-year-old thinkers. They were quite convinced the Underground Railroad had to do with above ground trains or subways. So I thought if I could bring into my students stories of real live people, documented stories, preferably from their community, that uh, this might help them understand this period in American history better. And I was writing for a community newspaper. I was working in the kind of a community development field, social work, but um, on the side, I wrote for a community newspaper uh, called The South End Scene, and I wrote articles about local African-American figures um, in the history of the community. And so we thought if we put our energies together, um, I would have more to write about and she would have more to take to the classroom. Right. The front hallway um, was one in which I remember just being sort of mesmerized by this huge crack that was running up the wall from the, you know, <laughs> right on the stairway. And, and you couldn't see the end of it because it was continuing up to the second floor and all. But again, Turn the Tide for me was the third time I walked in this building. I stood in the front hallway, stood under the underneath this medallion that's up, you know, in the plaster up over my head. And I thought, my goodness, Dr. Thomas Elkin stood here. Harriet Myers stood here. Freedom seekers came in here. They stood here. They walked through here. Stephen Myers stood here and so on. And it was that realization that all of a sudden transformed the space from what really was a very scary place into this, this beautiful, you know, sort of this beautiful space that was, was speaking with the voices of, of these folks who had been here. What was emerging to for us and to us were voices of people who had been written out of this history. Their accounts of Underground Railroad activism were dramatically different than what we generally call the standard retelling. And we were just so very excited about what we were engaging with that uh, we thought, you know, these, this is information that's bigger than our respective audiences and by rights belongs to the community. And so that's what became something of a tipping point for us to start to strategize on how we might share this information with the local community. When, when, when Underground Railroad Education Center first brought, bought the building, um, the architectural firm with whom we work, Paul has referenced it, uh, the Stephen Tilly Architectural Firm, uh, very well regarded in own preservation circles and all. They were very insistent that we board up the building. This is a you know building uh, that because of its condition we should board it up, seal it off, do all the prepar all the pre development work, get all the money lined up, get the construction done, and then open the building. Well. Paul and I were very concerned about that because this is a building. The Stephen and Harriet Myers residence is located in a residential community. It is a residential community that has suffered severe disinvestment, and it clearly struggles with the legacy of the institution of enslavement, as we would call it racism today. So you've got these factors that said to us, we cannot board up this building. We cannot go through this extensive process before we're ready to open it up. The agreement we came to is that the only space in this building we would use would be the front parlor. So from when un, when we bought the building in 2004 Four. until 2015, when the exterior restoration was completed, the building was stabilized and so on. Across those years, all we used was the front parlor. But in the, in that time period, we still we felt the need to keep the building alive and functioning. And so many times we would hold small events in the front parlor, uh, meetings in the front parlor, but other times we would also use the grounds around the Myers residence as a way to keep the building alive, um, you know, allow us to engage in programming, invite our neighbors in, that sort of thing. When we welcome people into the Myers residence, 
we make sure that they know up front that this is about a conversation. It's not about put the quarter in and Mary, Liz, and Paul as the tour guides, talk, 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 and then we move you from room to room, but rather it's about a conversation. And we really do enjoy people bringing their questions to us. Sometimes it's about the building. Why are there holes in the wall? Why is there no ceiling in the back parlor? What is the sculpture over here? You know, so so it gives people a chance to recognize that that there's that there's um more to a historic place than just that very, you know, just Stephen and Harriet Myers and, and what they did. It's like, this is, they did these, the things they did, but they did them in community and they had lived experiences. And so we look for ways you know, through the experiences we create here for people to make personal connections. One of the things that we were able to do with it because of funding available through the National Park Service Network to Freedom was to uh, place both to restore the back entryway of the first floor of the Myers residence and in doing that also add a lift to the back so entryway. Yeah. Network to Freedom has helped us along the way with various um, funding I know, uh, funding contributions. Yeah. Uh, Paul mentioned the historic structures report. We talked about the lift in the back, for instance. I'm sure there are other things. And I yeah, there was in the, there's at least one other something. So I think Network to Freedom has been very, very instrumental. And it also meant for us here in New York State that as other communities were researching their underground railroad history connections, by becoming part of the Network to Freedom, not only did we have our own on-the-ground conversations, but we also had these conversations then able to, to blossom, if you will, by coming together at Network to Freedom conferences and through grant funding that would allow us to come together as a small group, for instance. And So there was just a lot of synergy and a lot of opportunities to to have a foundation that and, um, in Network to Freedom that was saying what we're doing is valid and yeah, important. Right. And, and yet there was also room to open the doors for, you know, things to other things to, to happen through the Network to Freedom.